welcome to our video on immunology and vaccinations where we're going to be discussing a brief overview of the immune system. We'll go through the various types of immunity involved. We'll also talk about the different cells used that will help mount an antibody response against the pathogen when invading the human body. We'll be giving select examples throughout these with the most specific example that we're going to be focusing on being vaccines. This is a very controversial topic nowadays, so as such we will be defining what is a vaccine, we'll be going through the different types of classifications of a vaccine, as well as talking about the various components of making, manufacturing, and distributing vaccines. First up, we have immunity. This can be subclassified into two broad categories, innate versus adaptive. Your innate system is something you're born with, further subcategorized into two. Your physical barriers that occur at surfaces versus your subsurfaces, so something like your blood, which contains cells and proteins. Examples of your physical barriers are at epithelial surfaces, specifically your skin, mucous membranes, saliva, tears, urine, as well as stomach acid lining. Whereas the cells involved in your blood are all your fills, so your neutrophils, eosinophils, basophils, your macrophages, abbreviated as the symbol, your natural killer cells and your dendritic cells, all of which are white blood cells. Proteins involve the complement system. This is advanced immunology, but for completion's sake, we'll go through the three pathways involved, classical, alternative, and lectin. To kind of back up a little, these cells are all phagocytic cells, part of your innate immune system, that occur within hours of a pathogen invasion, whereas your adaptive system has lymphocytes that act after 12 hours. These can act through the humoral and cell-mediated immune system. Your humoral system uses B lymphocytes. Your B cells can be plasma cells that accompany the complement system, or clonal cells that go through and make memory cells. What that means is they will make antibodies that will recognize the same antigen in the future. These are immunoglobulins, IgMs, IgGs, IgAs. Whereas your cell-mediated immune system uses T-cell lymphocytes, three types here, your T-suppressors, your TH for helper, and your cytotoxic T-cells, which are killer cells. Your TH cells are known as CD4s, your TC cells are known as CD8s. Together, they will bring about the death of the pathogen invading the human body. Lastly, two more types of adaptive immunity we can talk about. One is natural or passive. The other is artificial or active, also known as acquired. So we have a little mnemonic here with the alphabet, the four A's all go together. An example of your natural passive immune system is maternal antibodies to the fetus, whereas artificial are vaccines, which is what we will discuss next. But first, we're going to go to our black screen of spaced repetition to quiz ourselves over concepts covered so far. So first up, first question, name the lymphocytes of your adaptive immune system. There are two types of lymphocytes we just discussed, one being your B cells involved in your humoral immune system, two being your T cells involved in your cell-mediated immune system. Next question. What is an example of artificial immunity? You guessed it, vaccines which is what we're going to be discussing next. This is part of your adaptive acquired active immune system. Again, your four A's all go together. Okay, so what is a vaccine? This is going to be a suspension of a given microbe to mount a certain antibody response against a future specific pathogen exposure. These can be further subclassified into four broad categories, one being whole agent vaccines, two being subunit vaccines, these are also sometimes known as conjugate vaccines, three being your toxoid vaccines, and four being a newer experimental vaccines known as recombinant vector vaccines. 
So let's go through and define each. Your whole agent vaccine is going to contain whole non-virulent microbe that is either going to be inactivated or weakened, also known as attenuated. Your inactivated is a killed vaccine versus your attenuated is a live one. What we mean by killed is the microbe has been killed using formalin and there is no risk of disease. A prime example of this being the rabies vaccine. The live attenuated vaccine is where the microbe has gone through multiple rounds of cell culture accumulating DNA mutations. Therefore, there is a small risk of disease as in the example of MMR. Next up, we have subunit vaccines that use a part of a microbe. These are also known as conjugate vaccines. They are specialized vaccines that use adjuvants. These are additional ingredients that help increase the effectiveness of the vaccine, and we'll go through what these are specifically in the next slide. But basically, this is another form of a completely inactivated killed vaccine. Again, this is only using a part of a microbe, not the whole non-virulent organism. So as such, there will be no posed risk of actually contracting the disease at hand. And a common example of this type of vaccine is the hepatitis B vaccine. Next up is our toxoid vaccine. These are used specifically when the cause of illness is from a bacterial toxin, hence the name toxoid vaccine. What this means is formalin has been used to inactivate the toxin at hand. Again, there is no posed risk of contracting the disease at hand. And the two most common examples here are your diphtheria and tetanus toxoid shots. Finally, we have our recombinant vector vaccines that use a weakened microbe to introduce the microbial DNA and or RNA to our cells. These are newer experimental vaccines that are currently being researched for something like HIV. And now let's go back to our black screen of spaced repetition review and quiz ourselves. What are the live attenuated vaccines? There's a mnemonic to remember here. Rome is my best place to go, which stands for rubella, the oral version of the polio vaccine, measles, influenza, mumps, yellow fever, the BCG vaccine given for TB, as well as the typhus vaccine. Next, are killed vaccines safe? The answer to this is yes, these are very safe. Because they are killed, they are completely inactivated and there is no risk of getting the disease. An easy way to remember an example of all these killed vaccines is to know the above mnemonic for the live ones, everything else is a killed vaccine. Lastly, we'll go through the different steps of vaccine development. One being how do vaccines work, two being what are their ingredients, and three being the different phases of clinical trials. Number one, how do they work? All vaccines contain an active component known as the antigen, which generates an immune response or the blueprint for making this active component in the event our body is exposed to a specific pathogen in the future. For example, I'm going to draw an antibody down below depicted as a Y shape with a microbe adjacent to it. The lighter colored blue dots are going to depict the antigen that the microbe has. And in this case, the antibody has seen this microbe before and has mounted an immune response against it. Whereas the picture below that has another new microbe with light colored purple spots this time. The antibody adjacent to it has never seen this before. And so the way a vaccine is going to work is it's going to contain a weakened, non-dangerous fragment of this microbe that includes the purple antigen and that is enough so that our body can learn to build this specific antibody against this microbe in the future. Then if the body encounters the real antigen later as part of the real organism, it already knows how to defend itself. And so on to number two, what are vaccine ingredients? There are six here that we'll go through. One being preservatives, which prevent the vaccine from becoming contaminated once the vial has been opened if it will be used for vaccinating more than one person. Some vaccines don't have preservatives because they are stored in one dose vials and are discarded after the single dose is administered. Next up, we have stabilizers. These prevent chemical reactions from occurring within the vaccine and keep the vaccine components from sticking to the vaccine vial. 
Then we have surfactants. These will keep all the ingredients in the vaccine blended together. Next, residuals are tiny amounts of various substances used during the manufacturing and production of vaccines that are not active ingredients in the completed vaccine. Then we have diluents. These are liquids used to dilute the vaccine to the correct concentration. And finally, we have adjuvants that improve the immune response to the vaccine. And lastly, number three, we'll go through the different clinical trial phases with the first one being where the vaccine is administered to a small number of people who are usually young and healthy. Next up, the vaccine will be given to a larger sample. These are also healthy and they will be compared to people without the vaccine. Whereas number three, last step, we're going to be administering the vaccine to an even larger sample of people for the specific given disease with two things in mind, safety, and effectiveness of the vaccine. And now back to our black screen, spaced repetition. Let's review one more time. What is the purpose of vaccine clinical trials? We just went through these two things. Number one being very important is the safety of the vaccine. Number two being its effectiveness. And this is something we'll discuss further in our next video on vaccines. And lastly, are vaccines safe? And the answer to this is yes, yes, yes. Although this is a very controversial topic, Vaccines have historically and statistically saved numerous lives and are needed for herd immunity. And with that said, this is an overview of everything that was discussed in the video. Please subscribe below and like and share.